We're joined in uh, this portion of our program on the fan, Sports Radio 66, Sports Radio 1019. I'm Bob Solter, joined by Dr. Brad Radu on our program. Uh, Dr. Radu is a professor of medicine at the University of Louisville, and he is joining us on our program. Well, we're going to be in- getting into an interesting discussion uh, about the topic of smokeless tobacco, in a way, and it's a subject that we have not touched on this program on this topic in a number of years. Uh, first of all, Dr. Radu, it's nice to have you join us. Good morning. Welcome to our program. It's a pleasure to be here. In beginning this field, let's do a little bit of uh, your background. Um, a natural question, and I always like to cover background on guests from the standpoint of people listening to us. How did you get into um, this field? Well, I'm trained as a dentist, and I specialized as an oral and maxillofacial pathologist. Mm -hmm. We're a rare breed. We're mostly at dental schools and major medical centers. And one of our areas of expertise is mouth cancer. It's a rare disease, but it's a very important one in that it's potentially fatal and uh, So we tend to uh, be experts in that. We make diagnoses, uh, we look under the microscope, and we assist uh, in the care of mouth cancer patients. Back in the early 1990s, I discovered that I had been misinformed about the risks of mouth cancer. And uh, basically, I understood that smokeless tobacco was a big risk factor for mouth cancer. And I found out that, in fact, it's entirely the opposite. That the, the actual epidemiologic research shows that smokeless tobacco is a very, very small risk factor for mouth cancer and all the other diseases that affect smokers. And so I suggested in a medical article that smokers might consider switching from cigarette smoking, which is very, very uh, risky, to smokeless tobacco, which had far fewer risks. And at the time that you did that and made that suggestion, what was the reaction? Well, you have to keep in mind that everyone in America, and especially in the medical profession, believed wrongly that smokeless tobacco was equally dangerous as cigarettes. And so the reaction was very, very negative. Um, many people didn't believe the evidence, and I spent, I've spent the last 20 years trying to educate smokers, my fellow medical colleagues, about the real risk differentials between smoking tobacco, that is burning tobacco, creating thousands of chemicals, versus just using a little bit of tobacco in your mouth or nowadays uh, in vapor. And these days, the reaction that you get to this idea, obviously, I'm assuming is vastly different than it was when you first suggested this? Yes, I think that... um, we've evolved to understand that it's the smoke that kills. And one of the important things that I think Americans are starting to understand is that nicotine, which is the addictive uh, agent in tobacco, does not cause any of the diseases that end up killing smokers, the multiple cancers, the heart disease, strokes, emphysema. Nicotine does not cause any of those diseases. It's an addictive drug. It's a drug we have to respect. But it's also a very 
beneficial drug for many, many people because it has some very positive properties that makes them want to use the drug. In somewhat same respects as caffeine, my favorite drug of addiction, that we consume in coffee, tea, cola drinks. Every day, millions of people consume caffeine, but in a smoke-free form, so it's relatively safe. And that's, in fact, the way that nicotine can be consumed if we change our mindset. Let's back up for a second because, you know, very often in these discussions, we use this term smokeless tobacco. And I always like to approach discussions as simply as possible because I wonder at times if everybody is on the same page, if everybody is as knowledgeable or fully knowledgeable. When I say those words smokeless tobacco to you, how do you define exactly what smokeless tobacco is? Well, smokeless tobacco in the United States consists of three major categories. The the most common that we see now is what we call moist snuff, and it's and it's called more commonly dip, dip tobacco. It comes in the round cans. It comes either loose where, where, where you take a pinch or it comes in small tea bag like packets. That's moist snuff or dip. The second type is loose leaf chewing tobacco. That comes in shredded. They actually shred the tobacco leaves, and it comes in foil pouches. That's probably originally the most commonly used form by baseball players, where they would take a a fairly large um, um, handful of it, shove it in their cheek, and basically play baseball. The third form is some is a very rare form nowadays. Unless you've lived in the South, you've probably never seen it. It's a powdered dry snuff product. It's the consistency of baby powder, basically. And it's been used by women in the Southeast since at least the Civil War. But in the last two or three decades, it's gradually been disappearing. So those are the three types of tobacco that we call smokeless tobacco. At times, when we talk about the idea of smoking and as you well know, there are many people who have attempted to quit and attempted to quit and attempted to quit because they quit, they fail, they quit, they fail, they quit, they fail, they go back to it. Why is that? Well, as, um, as uh, one of our authors Uh, One of our American authors said so famously, quitting tobacco is the easiest thing I've ever done. I've done it about a thousand times. Mm -hmm. It's it's the kind of thing that it's, it's a very powerful addiction. When we demand abstinence, that means no nicotine, no tobacco in any form. And some people become so powerfully addicted that they simply can't lead normal lives without um with without without the product now it's possible that some people can quit and what we see very commonly is they'll quit for six months or a year or two and then they'll hit a rough spot and it's it they reach for a tobacco product because it helps them with you know it it helps them 
live a normal life. And, um, you know, it's a relaxant when you're nervous. It also kind of wakes you up, as does caffeine, when you're getting drowsy. Uh, soldiers on uh, guard duty overnight sometimes use tobacco to keep them alert. Um, baseball players use smoke of tobacco because it's, when they're in the middle of the fifth and sixth innings and it's, they're getting bored. Uh, it's a long game with lots of downtime. I love baseball, so no, no problems. But, but it, that's the way that tobacco has been used by millions of people. It's enjoyable. They, they are satisfied by it, and they're, they're reluctant to give it up. We define an inveterate smoker as someone who is unable or unwilling to live completely free of nicotine and or tobacco products. I want to talk with you about the Federal Food and Drug Administration and this topic of smokeless tobacco. But let me just mention from the standpoint of folks who are listening to our discussion, we are in a chat on our program on The Fan, Sports Radio 66, Sports Radio 1019, with Dr. Brad Radu on our program. Uh, Dr. Radu, as I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion, is a professor of medicine at the University of uh, Louisville, and he's joined us by phone. After our 8 o'clock update is Rick Wolf, who's along with the Sports Edge program. And speaking of baseball, it's Ed Randall, who's talking baseball after our 9 o'clock update this Sunday morning. In this discussion, when we talk about this regulatory body of the federal government, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, what is the FDA really doing about the topic of smokeless tobacco versus what it, as an agency, as a regulatory body, should, in your opinion, be doing? Well, the FDA has assumed the same uh, vision as the entire federal government. Basically, the feds at all levels, the FDA, the regulatory agency, the CDC, um, the NIH, all these large federal agencies have one vision, and that is a tobacco-free society. Now, that's a euphemism for tobacco prohibition in the long run. And so the FDA has basically decided to treat all tobacco products not only as equally risky, equally dangerous, but equally evil, so that we must eradicate them. And, you know, the United States, um, we, we've been through a period of prohibition almost 100 years ago, and it didn't work out so well. And I, I Many of us in tobacco research and policy in the United States and um, throughout the world are concerned with prohibitionist policies. Not only will they not work, but they're simply ineffective in helping people lead longer and healthier lives. That's what tobacco harm reduction does. It basically educates people and gives them the opportunity to use vastly safer products. The FDA has made some major errors in treating all tobacco products as, as highly risk, as high risk. And it's, it's taking, regula taking regulatory actions that, in fact, might push people to cigarettes. And that, that would be a disaster from a public health standpoint. When 
we talk about this topic, you know, you have a very interesting background, as I mentioned, the fact that you're a professor of medicine at the University of uh, Louisville. Um, but I also understand that you've been involved in um, discussions surrounding the idea of tobacco harm reduction. You've testified before congressional panels on uh, this topic over the years. You've also um, authored an interesting presentation with the title of For Smokers Only, How Smokeless Tobacco Can Save Your Life. As I say that, I think, how is the discussion surrounding smokeless tobacco being framed by, I guess, the history of public attitudes towards smoking? I mean, those attitudes have changed, obviously, over the years. How has that impacted smokeless tobacco? Or has it? Well, as you said, um, or, or as we, just, we talked about earlier, the government is treating all tobacco products the same. And uh, to, to a large extent, Americans, and there have been some surveys about this, most Americans believe that smokeless tobacco is either just as dangerous or more dangerous than smoking because of the, uh, because of the um, massive misinformation campaign that's been conducted by the federal government um, and major medical organizations. They have refused to recognize the vast differences in disease rates and risk between smoking, high risk, high disease rates, and smokeless tobacco, disease rates that are barely, um, they're barely elevated above normal, above levels of non-tobacco users. That's how low the risks are. And uh, for example, um, a recent Department of Defense uh, article on their official website, health.mil. That's the official website of the Department of Defense Health Agency. They had an article completely equating these risks. And I worked with uh, senior Air Force military officials to have that article removed. And I've I've just um, des described that, um, that three-month uh, history on my blog, Radu Tobacco Truth. This is the kind of misinformation that we need to correct. And I believe the FDA, the CDC, the NIH has an ethical obligation not to misinform Americans about fairly safe smokeless tobacco products. Hmm. When we're talking about this topic and talking about the public and public awareness, How do you think public attitudes, and I guess based on what you've said to us thus far, even public knowledge of correct information on these topics can be changed? Well, it will be an uphill battle. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. If, if, if if I was informed and mouth cancer was my specific area, then 
it's hard to uh, it's it's a real challenge to to uh, try to expect that we will change that the the opinions and the and the information not only in the medical profession but in the American public at large. You know that's why I'm so excited to be on this program because it's a rare opportunity for me to actually talk about these these issues um, because so many people are misinformed. Everybody's already made their mind up about tobacco. It's all the same. It's all dangerous. When in fact uh, we we are we are uh, missing the opportunity to help the 40 million smokers in the United States. Uh, and additionally, you know, we've got somewhere between four to six million smokeless users in the United States. Anywhere between a third and half of them are also smokers. In other words, they enjoy both smokeless tobacco and cigarettes. And they don't know how much safer it would be for them to switch to smokeless, smokeless tobacco altogether and completely avoid cigarettes. So this misinformation campaign has real, uh, has real downsides to a lot of Americans. And, you know, what we're seeing, what we've seen is, is a misinformation campaign about smokeless tobacco historically. Now we're seeing the same kind of misinformation campaign being waged against vapor, e-cigarettes. And it's really unfortunate. And it, it's something that a small minority of professionals here in the United States and elsewhere, especially in Britain, are trying to correct. When you say especially in Britain, why? Well, it's interesting. The British government has endorsed tobacco harm reduction. It has recognized that there, in fact, are safer tobacco products, and it is actively encouraging smokers in Britain to switch to those products. Uh, you know, everybody considers the Surgeon General of the United States one of the highest medical authorities here. And every, everybody remembers that the Surgeon General in 1964 came out with the first report about the bad health effects of smoking. Right. What people don't realize is that the Royal College of Physicians was the first organization in, in the world to come out with a, uh, a report about smoking in 1962, two years before the Surgeon General did. The Royal College is one of the most prestigious and oldest medical societies in the world. They have endorsed tobacco harm reduction completely, and, and that includes smokeless tobacco and vapor. And they, they, there's a tremendous transition occurring in England right now because they are starting to recognize the value of these safer products. When we talk about the experience and knowledge in other countries, we also should touch upon what is being referred to as the Swedish experience. Would you share that with our listeners? Oh, I'd be delighted to. Uh, basically, when I first started doing this research back in the early 1990s, I took a look at the epidemiology of lung cancer. It turns out that lung cancer is the sentinel disease of smoking. In other words, you can tell how much a society has smoked over the past 20 or 30 years 
by the rate of lung cancer. And when I was looking at uh, lung cancer rates across a spectrum of countries throughout the world, I, one country just stood out, and that was Sweden. Men in Sweden had the lowest lung cancer rates in the entire developed world. And this has happened since, since uh, World War II. I mean, this has been over the last 50 or 60 years. And I found out that, in fact, men in Sweden use tobacco at essentially the same rate as men in all developed countries. It's just that they prefer smokeless tobacco. Moist enough in Sweden is called snus. And in 2002, I went to Sweden and conducted a research sabbatical there with some of Sweden's top medical uh, experts. And we published a series of uh, professional articles starting in 2002, and in fact, I published them for about 10 to 12 years. And we demonstrated that snus use in Sweden, moist snuff use in Sweden by Swedish men, has protected them from all of smoking-related diseases. And that's why they have the lowest lung cancer rates. They have low stroke rates, low heart attack rates. Basically, Swedish men have one of the longest life expectancies in the entire world. They may be second to Japan. Usually Japan and Sweden are very, very close because Swedish men don't smoke at anywhere near the rates. In fact, if all men in the European Union smoked at the rate of Swedish men, we would have several hundred thousand fewer deaths each and every year from smoking throughout the whole EU than we have right now. So Sweden is a remarkable story, and I spent years trying to bring the Swedish experience back to the United States because we have smokeless tobacco use here in considerable numbers, and they need to know how much safer it is. We're talking on our program on The Fan, Sports Radio 66, Sports Radio 1019 with Dr. Brad Radu. He is a professor of medicine at the University of Louisville. He's joined us by phone on our program. Rick Wolf, Sports Edge, follows our 8 o'clock update. Ed Randall's talking baseball this long after our 9 o'clock update on The Fan. I'm Bob Solter. When we talk about this idea of the Swedish experience you were just talking with us about, you know, um, I also need to bring up Swedish match um, and their application for uh, modified risk tobacco products. I'm assuming you are aware of that. Absolutely. And that application is actually with the FDA. Would you explain that for our listeners? Sure. You, you mentioned uh, previously that I have written a book for smokers only, How Smokeless Tobacco Can Save Your Life. Right. And um, in that book, I discussed, and I've done it um, also on my blog, Raw Do Tobacco Truth, I've discussed the four federal mandated warnings that one of which appears on every smokeless tobacco product sold in the United States. Three of the four warnings are either inaccurate or blatantly false. Number one, smokeless tobacco may cause mouth cancer. And, you know, there's very little actual evidence that moist enough and chewing tobacco actually cause any excess mouth cancer. In fact, a recent federal study that I've just blogged on shows absolutely no risk of mouth cancer among men in the United States. 
So that warning is tremendously exaggerated. Number two, smokeless tobacco can cause, um, uh, excuse me, smokeless tobacco can cause gum disease and tooth loss. I'm a dentist. I know those diseases. And I know the evidence for that in the scientific literature is very, very weak to none. That's number two. Number three, this product is not a safe alternative to cigarettes. And what they do there is they use the absolute safe. And when you do that, you can say that any product is not a safe alternative. Potato chips, uh, nature walks, nothing is safe. And yet, Smokeless tobacco is vastly safer. Now, the fourth warning is accurate. This product is addictive. No no issue with that warning. What Swedish Match applied to the FDA to do in April 2014 is remove the mouth cancer warning from its imported snus products that are available here. Remove the gum disease and tooth loss warning. And finally, change the warning about no safe alternative to a warning, to a notice, something like, while no tobacco product is perfectly safe, this product is significantly less hazardous than cigarettes. A perfectly accurate warning. The FDA denied all three changes. And it's a really devastating blow because they now have endorsed the, the, the basically false warnings in not letting those warnings become more accurate. But isn't it also the case that Swedish Match was really the first to receive um, I guess what are referred to as pre-market tobacco product approval for these new products coming from the FDA? That's correct. The FDA did give Swedish Match pre-market approval to market the products. But any product that has those uh, false warnings on it still has an uphill battle to, um, to basically win the hearts and, and appetites of smokers. Uh, you know, you, you, you buy a product, and although there might be some discussion that it's not as dangerous as cigarettes, with those federal warnings that now have been kind of further endorsed by the FDA, it's an uphill battle to compete with cigarettes when uh, we have that th- those uh, false warnings. Hmm. Well, let's talk about the big picture here. When we talk about public health and those who oversee public health in this country, is it your belief or opinion that this idea that all tobacco products have the same risks should not be the public health position in this country? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the science is crystal clear. There are dozens and dozens of epidemiologic studies that demonstrate the very low risks of smokeless tobacco and, of course, the much higher risks of cigarettes over a career of smoking 20 or 30 years. And so there is absolutely no basis for the continued, um, the continued policy that we treat all tobacco products equally. This idea of the interchangeable use of tobacco and smoking 
when talking about the dangers of smoking. Why does this take take place so often? Well, I, I'm I'm that's one question I have difficulty answering. I've documented in my blog how common it is for agencies and organizations to use the word tobacco when they really mean smoking. That conflation of the tobacco plant with disease and death, I believe, is deliberate. Uh, there is certainly no one that has, that has been involved in the tobacco field that could possibly confuse the tobacco plant and smokeless tobacco products, or I should say smoke-free tobacco products with a product where you light it on fire, you create five or 10,000 different chemicals, and you inhale those uh, tw tw 10 or 20 puffs at a time. It, it, it's just mind boggling that we would conflate those two things. So I, I guess I have to acknowledge that I believe it's deliberate. And why? Do you feel that the Centers for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration in this country are not putting out, I guess, what you'd refer to as kind of clear answers to the public about the relative risk of smokeless tobacco products? You know, I've tried, and many of my blog readers have tried to get accurate information. We have challenged the CDC We've asked the CDC, do you believe there is any difference between cigarettes and smokeless tobacco? And they refuse to answer. And so, you know, you would, you would have to engage someone at those agencies to understand why they don't believe the scientific evidence. I mentioned your book for smokers only, how smokeless tobacco can save your life. What was your hope in doing the book? Oh, I've always had one overarching goal, and that is to educate smokers about safer tobacco options. That's been my goal since I started in this field back in the early 1990s. You know, you have to understand where I came from. I've spent my career at major medical centers with cancer centers. So I've, take, I've taken care of, made diagnoses on many, many cancer patients. And when you take care of cancer patients, there's always the, and, and, they, and they're smokers, there's always the question, what if? What if they had had the opportunity and, been, and had been able to quit smoking before they became afflicted with this disease? And so after 20 years of taking care of cancer patients and coming upon this idea that there are safer tobacco products, that nicotine itself is not the problem, I, I started and I've never stopped to try to educate smokers. Interesting discussion with our guest on our program on the fan this hour, Dr. Brad Radu. Uh, Dr. Radu, as I mentioned, a professor of medicine at the University of Louisville, uh, the author of the publication uh, for Smokers Only, How Smokeless Tobacco Can Save Your Life. You've been very kind with your time. You also mentioned your uh, blog site. Would you mention that again, please? Yes, it's Rodu, R-O-D-U, Tobacco Truth. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, sharing in a discussion that I think is insightful and hopefully um, will inspire some of the folks listening to us to check out your material as well. Well, sure. thank you very much for your, for your uh, time and your questions.